there's something interesting about Taiwanese I want to share. They don't know how to keep a schedule. It is really, really fascinating. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've run into people in America who don't know how to keep a, keep a, they don't keep a calendar. Like they don't plan anything. They'll tell you, yeah, okay, tomorrow at 547. Well, I'll see you then. And then they just don't show up. And then you call them and they're like surprised. Like they don't understand why you're calling them. I, I, go, I try, try to explain this. See, there are, in terms of schedules, as with many things, there are two types of people. People who know how to keep schedules and people who don't. And, and it's kind of an impoverished, it's, it's sort of a poverty thing almost. But just in Taiwan, it's widespread. It's, it's, it's a schedule ability poverty. Uh, people know how to show up for work because someone else is telling them what to do. They know how to obey and bow. Oh, yes, yes, okay, you tell me to go. Okay, I'll go, I'll go. But do they lead their own lives? Do they tell themselves when, when to be where? No, they don't know how to boss their own lives. They'll let other people boss them, but they don't know how to boss their own lives. So they don't go anywhere. They don't, they don't know how to lead. They don't know how to accomplish anything. So I, you know, I've got friends in Taiwan who are incredibly wealthy. They they'll schedule an appointment for uh, you know eleven o'clock and not show up until twelve thirty. Um, those people are not going to be wealthy for very long, because uh, other places I see poor people, who who will m make an appointment for five thirty and they'll be there at five twenty, because they they want to keep their appointment. Now the one who's hardworking is going to have money and progress and reputation and skill and all kinds of good positive equity flowing into his life. The grammatical his. I'm not talking about uh, philosophical his. It's grammatical is his could be his or her. So those of us who know English know that. So in his life, she shows up early because, uh, you know, he knows that or she, whatever. So then you've got the, the rich person who's rich and wants to be free. And oh, I don't know uh, what I'm going to do with my time. I don't want anything to control me. I feel constrained if I'm forced to keep having good things come into my life. And so with time, they're not going to have their money. Controlling your schedule, you know, making a dedication to something, being, being dedicated, being strong, focusing on something, committing to something, following through with it, doing it. This is part of the thinking that makes anyone wealthy and stay wealthy. And the, the interesting thing was, here we are talking about walkaway movement. Okay, uh, are we going to walk away from cultural things that injure us? When I was in Chicago, my black roommate had to explain to me, and I, I don't want to, my black roommate, black, no, I had this black roommate. He was the president of the black fellowship on campus. I'm not going to say what the name was of the, it was, a, it, was the, it was the African fellowship. And his point was he was African American. I'm not being, I'm not trying to be politically correct. I just use the word black, but I'm being technical because it was a Bible campus. So we had lots of people from Africa. So you say black, well, what does that mean? Is it African or African American? So I'm not being politically correct here when I say African American. I'm trying to be technical here. We had Africans and then we had African Americans. And my black roommate was African American. He's like American black dude. And he's the president of this group. And his point was our fellowship should include Africans who were not don't do do not come from the slave history in America, just from Africa, because being on our campus from 10 feet away, nobody knows the difference. And so they're treated like black people from America, even though they're African, and that creates a whole new problem. So th this is what our fellowship is about on campus. That was his thing. That was his, what we call it, an agenda. It's, it's the, the, the list of things to do as the leader. It's called an agenda. Agenda is not a bad thing, unless you're a company, and then it can be a terrible thing. Uh, maybe depending. I mean, you have a meeting, a business meeting, and you have an ad meet agenda for the meeting. That's okay. But other than the business meeting, companies aren't supposed to have agendas. But politicians and leaders are supposed to have agendas. It's, this is a you know this is how English works. Okay, so his agenda as a leader was to include Africans and African Americans in Black people issues on campus. That was that was his thing, and he was my roommate for a year, and. Uh, I, t I tell you what, um, 
great friend, but he would tell me the truth about a lot of different things. Well, we were friends before we were roommates, and, and here I am in Cabrini Green constantly, a kid that I mentored, I'm still in touch with him today. Love him. Absolutely love this guy. Um, you, know, you know, my father, the kid was uh, 10 years old. My father took him out in the backyard and shot him. Shot, shot. <laughs> That's going to be quotable. My father took him out in the backyard and taught him how to shoot a rifle. There's a 22. You got to wear the safety, you know, you put on the glasses and don't point it where you're not going to shoot it. And this is how you hold it. Oh my goodness, he was so happy. I mean, because he's grown up with this culture that was fascinated with firearms. And he was just so happy that he'd finally shot a gun. And he told me recently on the phone, he said, as a kid, it, I loved that because that took away the curiosity. So I was no longer interested in finding firearms. I'll tell you right now, you want to you wanna decrease shooting in Chicago? Teach kids how to use guns. Oh, that's right. When you've got Democrats running the city who think that guns are the problem, uh, they're going to make sure that children grow up with a fascination of guns, a.k.a. outlawing and banning guns, so that on the black market, it's the super ultra fascination and cool thing. Right, right, right. Okay, that goes back to the whole issue about laws needing to be enforceable. So actually, you know, when Democrats try to ban something that can't be banned, like it's like out, making it illegal to breathe. I mean, you can do that, you, but you haven't changed breathing. You've just defined everybody as a criminal. In, in, in the Supreme Court, they'll talk about this. Uh, uh, was it, um, I, I, I want to think it was, uh, a, was it Alito? I want to think it was Alito who said, you can tell a child that he has to call everyone his friend, but if you do, you haven't given that child any new friends. You've just changed the meaning of the word friend. See, that's the kind of stuff that people talk about in the courts. So by outlawing something that people are not going to stop doing, all you've done is give rise to criminals because they're not afraid to go break the law. And so it, by that, doing that kind of stuff, you created a third world legal system. So just as I've established, Taiwan has a third world legal system. So do zones where Democrats have their ultimate controls. Because in order to survive, you have to break the law. And, and I get that. I see, I'm the white guy who grew up in Michigan. I'm not angry at black guys for having guns in the inner city. Now, there's guns and violence, and this is a problem. And if you're in Chicago, that's not a way to live. That's, that's not going to solve the problem. I, I, but I get the situation. If, if you're a black guy in Chicago, and you're trying to not get swallowed up by that culture, then my head is off to you, and you can see my receding hairline. So, I would... Uh, uh, I mean, problems are multi-angled. You can't have this absolute agree or absolute disagree with everything that people say. We're talking about walk away. How about let's walk away from the idea that you have to agree with every word or hate every word and want to kill the person who's talking. How about, how about we don't have that opinion? How about we just have words and discussions and uh, we don't even agree or disagree. It's just a, a discussion. How about that? I mean, in a meeting in the government, this is how government works. In the meeting, they have discussion and then they have voting and they're different times. Many people don't know how to separate the discussion time from the voting time in their lives. And that's why they don't know how to control their own government. Now, it all starts from scheduling. Here my black roommate is in Chicago having to explain to me, Jesse, they don't understand scheduling. I was volunteering with a ministry that had a pastor and <laughs> we had on-campus politics problems. Um, maybe I shouldn't get into that, but there were people on our campus trying to do stuff in Cabrini Green and they were not talking with African Fellowship, which was a problem. My black roommate had a problem with that because he was a leader at that problem. And then the ministry that I was dealing with was a ministry that my college had a relationship with, but the college group on campus trying to do ministry in the same place was not talking to the church that I was volunteering at. 25 years, my, my, the, the pastor of that church said, I never once heard from that group at your school. And we both started the same year. We we're both 25 years old and they never said boo to me. So I'm working with this guy who's been in Cabrini Green for all these years and he explained the same thing. I mean, because this kid shows up at this after school program and, 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 and 
the, the, the guy says, okay, you're supposed to have a paper from your mom to give me today. And the kid says, uh, my mom couldn't sign the paper today. And he says, okay, why not? He said, because she had to go to the store. And he says, okay, well, tell your mom she's got to get the paper tomorrow. He said, okay, I'll tell her. And I asked the guy, what? She can't, she has to go to the store so she can't sign a paper. He says, well, in order to sign the paper, she's got to go to the school. I said, but that takes five minutes. He says, in poverty, people don't understand that. It's, it's, he'd been in Cabrini Green working with people for 25 years. If he didn't understand this, he would have come across like some white supremacist. And yes, he was white. And yes, all the black people in Caribbean Green loved and accepted this guy. Drug dealers knew who he was. He didn't mess with them. And they kind of protected him. Because a lot of them were his kids in his after school program who grew up to be drug dealers. So they knew this guy. Okay, so like this was Cabrini Green. Oh, man, I, I could talk about Cabrini Green. This is Cabrini Green was one reason I didn't have culture shock when I came to Taiwan. So he's explained to me, he says, Jesse, you've got to understand poverty. I, I, I hope it's not considered racist to say that Cabrini Green at that time uh, was uh, arguably anyway, uh, a state had a state of poverty. I, I, I mean, it was government funded. I mean, I hope that they're not giving government money to people who don't need it. But uh, so here we are in Cabrini Green and this guy's explaining to me, Jesse, poverty thinking the, 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 the mother has to go shopping. Okay. Let's say, and, and she doesn't, she doesn't get the concept that she can do more than one thing in a day. N nobody gets that. The dad doesn't get, nobody gets that. So, so the mom will think, okay, today I have to go to the store. And that's the only thing she does all day. She's there three hours and that's it. And the idea that she also should go to the school for only five minutes to get a paper signed, she doesn't get that. Go to the school for five minutes, she doesn't understand that. It's go to the school and that's what I do today. I can't do that because I have to go to the store today. Because they don't know how to plan. And the same thing goes on in Taiwan. People don't know how to plan. So if you're planning to go to Asia as an ESL teacher, Get ready for people to not know how to plan anything. I mean, having friends is nearly impossible because it, the, the best things in life come only by planning them. People who don't plan, as I, a friend in America, father's a doctor, mother teaches nurses for their master's degrees. Accomplished parents, wealthy, they golf, they kayak. <laughs> and he says, Jesse, my family never plans anything. And it's not because we don't know how. It's because we don't want to be committed in case something better comes along. Interestingly, the parents got divorced. You know, the best things only come with planning. But when you, when, when you don't get that, it's, it's like there's a part of your brain, a part anyway. You could be from any political class. You could be from any, well, political class. See, I've been in Asia too long where politics actually has a class. You go to Vietnam, there's the secret closed off party. And it's like, how do those people get there? Is it money? No, they're members of the Communist Party. They're members of the party. Yeah, so you have a political class. Sorry. Well, see, and our people argue that that's what Washington tries to be. Washington's trying to be a de facto political class. Like you're in the group, so you're better than the people and the law doesn't apply to you. Like I've seen that at work here in Asia. So it doesn't matter what your social class is, where your money comes from. You could be rich, poor, it doesn't matter. But if you don't know how to schedule and keep appointments and you don't know how to make that work, then it's like a part of your brain is in poverty. And sooner or later, you're going to lose the rest of your money. You can go downhill real fast because your kids won't know how to, how to file their own commitments. Because that, the commitment... To the people that, that have scheduling poverty, it's, it's, it's not poverty of money, it's poverty of the ability to keep a schedule. People that have that problem, they don't know, um, it, it's like they don't understand that having a schedule gives you more power to do more things. They don't see that, so they feel constrained because all the little tiny immediate things right around them that they're missing out on because they don't see what's coming in the long run. That's all for today.